The City of Phoenix holds community budget hearings throughout April, allowing residents to comment and make suggestions on the City Manager's trial budget before final decisions are made. This public discussion is among the reasons the City's budget so closely matches the community's highest priorities each fiscal year. Good evening. Welcome to our meeting. Um, it was interesting, I, I just met a lady who said that um, the city manager must be keeping me in hiding because people have never seen me before. <laughs> so let me start by saying I'm Milton Dahoney, the assistant city manager. Uh, I've been in Phoenix for uh, exactly one year. So I made it through a summer and looking forward to my second summer, but more importantly, my second winter. <laughs> so uh, thank all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, this is one of 12 budget hearings that we're holding around the city in order to get feedback from the public and to give you a, an overview of the manager's proposed budget. Uh, we do have an interpreter with us this evening and I would ask her to introduce herself. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is being taped uh, by Phoenix 11, our uh, YouTube channel. So we ask that anyone that speaks this evening use the microphone so we can be sure uh, and pick that up. Uh, I would ask that uh, city employees that are in the audience, will you hold your hands up, please, so people can see you. So uh, in case we have detailed questions, uh, they are here to listen, but may be of resource to us. Uh, we also are glad to have uh, Councilman uh, Daniel Valenzuela with us uh, this evening. And uh, I'll ask him to make some uh, opening remarks. Let me run through the agenda of what will happen. Uh, we will show you a video that provides an overview of the budget. And as soon as that's over, uh, we will go to speaker cards. So if you want to make comments on the budget, we ask you to fill out one of these cards and we will go through each person. Uh, we'll have up to three minutes to give their comments. Uh, there will be minutes taken from this meeting and they will be made available to the mayor and all of the council members. So that's sort of the agenda for the evening and with that, uh, I'd invite Councilman Valenzuela to make some remarks. Thank you, thank you Milton. So, uh, <clears throat> first time I met Milton, uh, it was it was at City Hall. Milton was one of the the finalists for the city manager's job right here in Phoenix. Incredibly impressive, and uh, the the city council. If you've been watching all of the meetings, I know that we all like to joke about this that we don't always agree unanimously on on a whole lot. But everyone in that room was blown away by by this man, and uh, and we're very fortunate to have Ed Zerker as our city manager. Uh, but I got to tell you, it, that was such, and, and as, that's saying a lot because, you know, I mean, I, I personally have known uh, Ed, I, I support Ed, uh, uh, but that was the toughest, that was one of the toughest decisions as a council member uh, that, that, you know, that we've had to make. As far as I'm concerned in this form of government, who you choose to be your city manager is the most important decision that you can make. And, uh, and, and we've been blessed because, you know, it comes down to these two and we get them both because we got Ed and the best decision Ed made was to reach out to this man uh, and, and uh, it worked out and there's such a great team or a better city for it. We have some great uh, people in the audience, all the hands went up. I'm glad Milton raised the hands of our city employees. Uh, both police and fire is represented. We have uh, Assistant Chief Curtinbach here, and we have our Deputy Chief uh, Chip Gleason back here, and, and, and so many, our Budget Director Mario Paniagua, and, and so many others are here. Uh, you may remember a few years ago, it was just a few years ago that we never had a budget hearing this far west, uh, never. And it's one of the things that I said that we would change and we have changed it. So uh, this is, I want to say the fourth uh, consecutive year that we've had one in far west Phoenix right here at Vita Paz. And thanks to 
uh, principal, Danny Portillo, uh, who, who's made it happen for us. So thank you, Principal Portillo. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this trial budget. Now I wanna remind everyone that this is just the trial budget. This is, this is where we give the city manager and his team, including Mario here, an opportunity with all of the numbers, you know, we ask them to, 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 to dive in and create the best budget they think they possibly can create, a starting point, if you will. Then we bring it out through the month of April for all of these budget hearings. And, uh, and for those of you who come out to these budget hearings year in and year out, you, you realize that the budget that we end up with, the one that is adopted at the very end, is always a little different than what we started with. And I'm always encouraged by that because that is the public process at work. That final budget hearing, that, or that final budget that is uh, adopted will have your fingerprints on it. And I hope you feel that way, okay? Through the, for the sake of transparency, it's always videoed, as Milton was mentioning. It'll be on the, the city's website. Uh, encourage your friends and family to take a look at what was said tonight. Uh, we will have another budget hearing coming up. We have one that's live that we do online that Mayor Stanton, uh, uh, you know, will host and give everyone a chance to send in your questions. Um, and and you know, one of the I, actually a couple of the highlights that I really appreciate out of this budget, you know, public safety as far as I'm concerned is the number one priority of any government. And, uh, and I'm not just saying that as a first responder myself, I'm a Glendale firefighter, as you know, uh, but finally, this is the budget that, I, that we've been waiting for, uh, and, and I believe this is what we can expect moving forward, because in this particular budget, we have, uh, I wanna say 110 police officers, which is a real number. Well, it's 110 officers for this, for this particular budget and 90 firefighters, okay? Uh, which is a, a big deal. Uh, you know, we, we need to, instead of just simply saying public safety is number one priority and then we realize we haven't hired a cop in three years, you know, I mean, we, it doesn't add up, right? So, so we have been hiring police officers, we've been hiring firefighters, a lot of it has to do with grants, but this is a budget that we've been really waiting for. And so, you know, please give us an opportunity to help tweak that. I really appreciate our police commander who was here. We have neighborhood leaders. And I wanna also acknowledge our state senator who just walked in, Martin Casada, who's here with us as well. Thank you for, it. Martin represented us all. Uh, the, this session just ended and I think I can, the bruises are almost gone. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't bruise easily, he's a fighter. So, so that said, I, I'll, I'll hand it over and we can get this show on the road. Thank you so much. It represents a year of really hard work. Leadership. Hello everyone and welcome to one of a dozen hearings on the city manager's 2015-16 trial budget. Input from our residents is so important and helps shape what will end up being the final budget for the next fiscal year. The final budget is important because it provides the plan for how the city will spend taxpayer money and how services that you depend on could be impacted. I'm really pleased with this trial budget because it represents a year of really hard work. Leadership by the mayor and council to make some tough decisions, our employees who took concessions and who've worked hard to save money, and our partnership with our residents to bring a balanced budget for 2015-16. Why is a balanced budget important? It's required by state law and city charter. In this budget, there will be no cuts to the city services that you count on every day. I think it's important with this budget to know that we brought it into balance without cutting any services and we can actually add some very important things for the community. 
even with state fiscal actions negatively impacting Phoenix costs and revenue, and with the sunset of the emergency sales tax on food on March 31st. The budget is balanced and important additions are being made thanks to the hard work of everyone. The funding for the city budget comes from different sources. It's not all coming from one place and, and it's divided into three main areas, the general fund, enterprise funds, and special revenue funds. Examples of general fund city departments include police, fire, the library, parks and recreation, and streets. Enterprise fund departments include aviation, water services, solid waste services, and the convention center. Special revenue funds account for designated sources of money for a specific purpose, like sales tax dollars for the hiring of police officers and firefighters and funds for public transit. So when you look at all of those areas together, that's really the diverse mix of all the things that makes up our city budget. The mayor and city council took action early on, leading us to a balanced budget. That includes eliminating 162 full-time general fund vacant positions last December. For a second year, additional employee compensation concessions at just under 1%. And over the last several years, the city has eliminated nearly 100 management positions and cut overtime costs by more than 50%. The efficiency efforts by city staff have been remarkable. The city is less than $2 million away from reaching its 2015 savings goal of $100 million over the past five years. The mayor and city council have also led reforms of the civilian pension system. In total, we can expect to see a savings of around $830 million over two decades, thanks to the actions already taken by the mayor and city council, along with the city pension board and voters. This will have a positive long-term impact on the budget, although there is still more work to be done. In addition, the zero-based budget review process, looking at every program, has led to $1.2 million in savings for 2015-16. Every line item in the budget was scrutinized, which allows the city to find ways to save. Among the savings, $600,000 by closing two courtrooms where the number of cases has dropped considerably. $225,000 saved in the finance department by relying more on technology and reducing postage costs for mailing monthly statements. $200,000 in street transportation by analyzing signage and determining which road signs are unnecessary to install, maintain, or produce. These are just a few of many ways that staff has found to improve efficiency. To see the full list of savings, check out the budget summary packet provided at these budget hearings and is also available on phoenix.gov. One of the biggest challenges the city faces this year has to do with what's happening at the state level. In an effort to balance its budget, the state has shifted costs and reduced revenue to cities like Phoenix. That has led to a $6.3 million negative impact on the city, which in turn eliminated a $4.3 million surplus, which would have been used to address important city needs. This created a $2 million deficit. To balance it out, here's what the trial budget suggests. Holding off on replacing some older city vehicles and equipment, along with slowing the growth of the city's contingency fund, which is still at its highest level in city history. Here's a look at the new services proposed in the trial budget. First, let's look at the general fund. The budget adds $14,000 for implementing full-time recreation at the county-provided Cofelt Rec Center. It's located at 19th Avenue in Buckeye. That means the existing rec center will be filled with kids year round. In the area of innovation, the budget adds a business analyst to begin preparations for Phoenix 311, which would provide a centralized information center, as well as identifying technology needed to implement a unified municipal services card. And many residents feel that protecting the public should be the city's top priority, 
That's why public safety amounts to 71% of the general fund in this trial budget. This budget adds an additional $2 million for 40 hours of police officer training for every officer. Now to dedicated public safety special revenue funds. Due to the fact that these funds will be balanced next year, the budget includes the hiring of 110 police officers in 2015-16, which will increase the size of the police force from where it is today. The council also approved a plan to hire 90 firefighters next fiscal year after hiring approximately 75 this year. Now let's look at dedicated Phoenix Parks and Preserves Initiatives funds. Those funds would provide maintenance for three new desert preserve trailheads, creating more opportunities for residents to enjoy our preserve trails. From the Development Services Funds, which is paid for by building permit and inspection fees, is this proposal, making for a better customer experience in planning and development services with improved technology and training and more staff to enhance the electronic plan review section and the front counter service. Now to dedicated transit funds. The light rail is seeing more riders now than ever before. The proposed budget would fund rail operations for the new Northwest extension to 19th Avenue and Dunlap. Out of dedicated aviation enterprise funds comes an important improvement at Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. It's one of the 10 busiest in the nation. The trial budget calls for the addition of a dedicated team at the airport to analyze noise impacts of flight activity, assess any proposed changes by the FAA, and to reach out to the community to solicit feedback and exchange information. Out of the Solid Waste Special Enterprise Funds, the trial budget calls for operating a composting facility which will divert several tons of green waste per week from the landfill. That facility is scheduled to open next year. But the list of community needs continues. Among them, police body cameras, addressing homelessness, restoring library hours, after school programs, support for arts programs, park maintenance, and street maintenance and street landscaping. Any budget requires trade-offs and street landscaping is an example of that. It is important to keep our city beautiful and safe by making sure trees and shrubs along the roadways are maintained. Right now, that happens when residents make a report, but that could soon change. The council will soon vote on whether to bid for the service, which means the roadways would be regularly maintained three times a year. Although funding is not currently available to increase this service, the Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee is evaluating additional options which would increase the frequency of street landscaping service with added costs estimated to range from $1.5 to $6 million. Additional funding sources would need to be identified. So the 2015-16 trial budget is really good news. We balanced the budget with no cuts to services, and in fact, we've added some things that are important to the community. But we always want to be looking ahead, and so we have a five-year plan we forecast ahead, and we see that we have some issues to deal with after this year. One of the biggest challenges to the general fund public safety pension costs. Much work has been done on the civilian side controlled by the city, but the state-controlled system still faces challenges. This trial budget assumes phasing in added public safety pension costs over the next three years, allowing city services to be preserved. Also, revenue growth will be affected by actions taken by the state on income and sales taxes. The city is planning ahead on both of these issues and will work hard to address them over the next 12 months. Keep in mind, the budget hasn't been adopted just yet. Your input is important and the City of Phoenix wants to hear from you on what the upcoming budget should look like. 12 public hearings will take place this month across all council districts and you are encouraged to attend. You can also send your comments or questions to budget.research at phoenix.gov or to reach out to us by phone, call 602-262-4800. You can also comment on social media by using hashtag PhoenixBudget.
Thank you for being part of a very important process. The City of Phoenix is committed to its mission of improving the quality of life in Phoenix through the efficient delivery of outstanding public services. So <clears throat> that's the uh, summary. That's the summary of the manager's trial budget. The proposed budget is due to be presented to City Council on May the 5th. So we're still a couple of weeks away from that. And now uh, we're ready to go uh, to our speaker cards. And uh, Councilman, you want to handle that? Okay, typically, uh, for the sake of time, want to be sure that everyone uh, is, has a chance to come up to the mic. We give a couple of minutes. So first, we have Valerie Roller. Is that correct? Thank you for having. Okay. Thank you for having an open forum, especially clear out here on the West Valley. I've lived in Arizona since 1979. I do not live in Phoenix at this time, but I'm concerned about a couple of different things in the budget. First of all, Phoenix always led the rest of the country. We were the example for the rest of the world. Now we are following the example of San Francisco and New York. Why? Why are we following anybody's example? Why do we need one ID for the municipal area? That doesn't make any sense. Am I, because I don't actually physically live in Phoenix now, not going to be allowed? Or are we going to open it up and let every single buddy in the entire, the entire valley have services paid for by the taxpayers? My other concern is the light rail. To me, it's nothing more than a money pit. I have yet to have one person tell me how wonderful it is, how efficient it is, how great it is. What I hear are complaints constantly about how it ties up traffic, about how much money we spend, which currently is one point, what is it, $161 million per mile to make it. I just think it's a terrible money pit and we're throwing our money away. We need to be more responsible to the taxpayers and stop trying to be like everybody else in the country. Phoenix is unique. Phoenix is wonderful. We don't need to be like New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just want to mention a couple of things. Thank you. On uh, the light rail, the City of Council did refer the transportation initiative to the ballot. So you'll see that in your August uh, uh, ballot. I. You know, I've never been one to uh, shy away from my position on things. I think everyone deserves to know that, especially if you're in the council district that I represent. I am absolutely 100% for the transportation initiative. It is the, um, it's, it's an economic development engine. It's a tool. It's more than, it's not just a cost. It's an investment. When you think of the 20 miles of light rail that is laid out through the valley right now, that 20 miles of light rail, if all you talk about, if all, that, if all we hear about is the cost, then we're going to hear $1.4 billion. It's a lot of money, $1.4 billion. What we need to understand also is that already it has about eight, an $8 billion return on investment. Uh, and that's, that's an investment that I think we need more of. Uh, a third of that initiative, the way it was you know, proposed, if it passes, a third of those monies go into our dense neighborhoods right here in West Phoenix. Um, neighborhoods like West Phoenix. I don't want to make it sound like a third of all of those monies come here. But a third of those monies come into these really dense, densely populated uh, neighborhoods where we need street repair. We need these things and, and our infrastructure is going to continue to, to age. You do bring up an excellent point. Uh, as far as the, the, the ID conversation, we don't know what it is. In, in fact, that, you know, I, I, I sit on the, on the uh, education subcommittee where it was uh, proposed and the thought is, would it save money instead of having a library card, a tran you know, a bus card, a whatever card to condense those things? 
that's the conversation that has been had at the city of Phoenix. We, as far as we know, we could save money if we just condense those types of things. I know that there's been a lot of uh, a concern and there's been a lot of talk about something that frankly has never been discussed at, at that particular meeting. In fact, that meeting is archived also. I would encourage everyone to go back and, and view what was um, discussed and more meetings would be, uh, you know, will be in the near future. We would encourage everyone to come out. Uh, and, um, and so that said, and I'm happy to, to you know, have the, the more of that discussion um, so that you have that. Thank you for, for joining, us, joining us, Ms. Roller. The next card is Libby Coiner. Did I say that right, Libby? Yeah, Coiner. I am um, Libby Coiner. I'm actually the District 5 representative for the Complete Streets Advisory Board, um, which is a really, really exciting group. We're talking a lot about improving conditions in terms of transit, improving um, pedestrian facilities, bicycle facilities, and um, facilities for persons with disabilities. Um, so it's a conversation that, that needs to be had in Phoenix because we're really lagging behind um, I'm actually here on behalf of the bicycle community. Um, I'm part of a group called Phoenix Spokespeople, and um, we've been showing up for the last three years harassing you guys, and we're going to keep doing it. Um, this year, we're asking for a modest dollar fifty a person to be dedicated to bicycle infrastructure. Um, and first off, I actually wanted to thank you, Councilman, for supporting bikes, for supporting bike share, and and for your My Fit Phoenix project because um, it, it's something that really needs to happen. Um, anyway, we are, we're here requesting $1.50 a person um, in favor of bicycling. Um, right now, the inadequate bike infrastructure actually really endangers a lot of communities downtown where I live, but also especially in underserved communities like, like Maryvale and like West Phoenix where people really rely on on these forms of transportation to get around. Um, currently, Phoenix and Fresno are tied as the deadliest cities to ride a bike. So that's not a very good statistic to have. Um, lack of infrastructure for bicycles also kind of keeps us behind our peer cities in terms of promoting active and healthy transportation. And I'm actually not just talking about cities like Portland and San Francisco and New York. Um, I attended the National Bike Summit about a month ago and heard the mayor of Oklahoma City speak. And he said that um, when his city was named the most obese city in the country, that's when he realized he needed to change things. And his city actually kind of banded together. They, um, they started a fitness program. They collectively lost a million pounds. But what he said he realized is his city was engineered um, to promote a very car-oriented lifestyle. It didn't facilitate active transportation. So um, the problem with, with not promoting active transportation is that a lot of businesses, um, a, lot of, a lot of companies will not want to come into your city if you don't offer those amenities. Um, more and more people are talking about millennials not wanting to move to cities that don't offer transit or bicycling. So you're not going to get the, the big think tanks for Google or, or, um, or eBay and these kinds of things. So we really need to think about this. And I, I like that you said that it's, it's an economic development tool because we really need to think in, in the future for, for how we want to design Phoenix, for the, the future of Phoenix. Um, we're losing a lot of young people who say, I'm, I'm sick of living in this car-oriented city and being a slave to my car. And, they're moving to places like Portland and, and San Francisco. So I'm, I'm really excited that you're having these discussions. Um, and again, I would just like to encourage you to build in $1.50 a person or more for bicycle infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you for representing District 5 so well, Libby. The, uh, so, so it'd be great to have a multimodal city where you can have you know, whatever mode of transportation you want, and we have the infrastructure for that. Uh, public transportation is incredibly vital, especially to our community. And uh, so I support multimodal, meaning it could be light rail, it could be, of course, cars. That's how I got here today. You know, I'm not ashamed of that. Um, 
bicycles, but let's not forget, people use walking as well as a mode of transportation. And do we have shaded areas to walk? And we should be thinking of all those things. Uh, in my research, and I chair downtown aviation redevelopment, which a lot of it is economic development. If you want to land the high wage sector, they're looking at two things, they're looking at infrastructure and education. And if a community is not investing in one or both, we, we have to think about that. You know, so, so, uh, so I really appreciate your thoughts uh, on, on that. Uh, Vicki Jaquez. And while Vicki's coming up, I want uh, Suzanne Thrain, you're next. Uh, I also want to mention that Doug Mings is here also, who is with the mayor's office. So uh, I want to mention the mayor's office is present here. Uh, hi, my name is Vicki Hakes. I am a, I've been in Phoenix since 1991. I moved here from California. Um, I, there are several things that I am very involved in, and um, I, first of all, thank you for uh, hiring those uh, 110 officers um, and having those in the budget, but we do still need a lot more. Um, although we've got the 110 coming, um, there's more being lost via uh, attrition than anything. So we need, we need more officers. As far as the fire department, it's the same, the same issue. Um, we need to get more out there to protect our safety. Um, one of the other things is it says that you're having um, hiring some more part-time staff to um, to be at the Cofelt um, Recreation Center. Um, here in the West Valley, we have El Oso Park, which was renovated a few years ago, and we have nobody there that provides any type of um, uh, after-school activities or any type of activities for kids. Um, that park is between two schools, between a middle school and a high school, and it's being used more for um, hangouts and not recreation um, activities because there's nobody there to help and, and provide that. So um, if you could uh, try to include that in there, appreciate it. Um, neighborhood services, um, I see that you're hiring an, another inspector, but Again, we lost a few of them a few years ago. We need to get more just because of the graffiti issues, the blight issues that are out there. There's nobody, again, out there to cite people that's not, um, that's using their houses as dumps or not caring about their property. And um, finally, I know um, we went through a recession um, and for a while there, nobody was building onto their homes or taking care of them, but um, now they are. And we have, there's no inspectors going out there to take care of these houses. We're having a lot of fi uh, fires in these houses because of electrical issues or just various things. And we need to get more inspectors out there to try to get that taken care of. So um, thank you again. And hopefully you'll be able to take those thoughts into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, Suzanne Thrain, and I want to say this is the third time I've seen Vicki at a, at a budget hearing in April, and this is number four that I've seen Suzanne. It's, it's so the, the video just mentioned there are 12 of them throughout the city, and you know, three of them, there are eight council districts, three right here in District 5, and the fourth is just outside. And Suzanne made it to all four, and probably probably more that I'm not. I wasn't at, but thank you for right. being here. That's all right. It, it's uh, when uh, when we have years uh, when police and par and fire and parks are not on the line, of community centers, um, uh, we don't seem to get quite as excited uh, by the masses as we do otherwise. Um, I want to say thank you very much for. Uh, putting in the funding for the uh, training for police officers and for the 110 to be hired and the firefighters, the 90 of those. Again, uh, by, the time, by the time they get through 
those who make it through academies, it's, we're still down, and, and you know that. You know that very well. Um, the next thing that followed that on the proposed budget is the information and technology services. Uh, I have been to all kinds of uh, uh, meetings or, uh, or committees uh, where what comes back to us from city personnel is that when we get the technology up to where it needs to be, we'll be able to institute this or we'll be able to do that. We'll be able to get information, like for instance, on evaluations, metrics, uh, on a variety of things. Like for instance, um, uh, I applaud you young lady for speaking up about infrastructure. Uh, my husband and I were, uh, had a great time downtown for the um, Irish, event and the Scottish event uh, and we rode the light rail okay so we so we and we went downtown for dinner uh, if I had a dollar and a half for every green bicycle I saw in the parking places not being used either when we went in the morning or when we came back in the evening and if I had a dollar and a half for all the people who didn't buy their four dollar all day pass uh, and for, for no one to collect the tickets. Um, those were both ouches uh, for me, um, and I think a loss for the city, and I realized that uh, maybe it doesn't compensate uh, hiring, some, hiring people for the light rail, uh, and I'm okay with the uh, progress, I'm okay with all of those things, but you know I'm not real thrilled about our tax dollars uh, sort of wasted on the light rail had a lot of people, a lot of young people, few older, uh, a lot of young people, and nobody sticking out their tickets, taking them up. And, and the same thing I'd like to mention about fines in the city. Uh, if a, um, if neighborhood services uh, has a property that is just awful and ends up in a fine, I think that ought to go, that funding money should go to neighborhood services instead of general fund. And let neighborhood services use it for what they think they need the most. Maybe they might hire another inspector. The same with uh, if, they ha if the police have to tow someone. Uh, maybe they might be able to uh, scrounge up enough money uh, how about on, I mean, do they get the money if, if they pick up somebody who had a big warrant uh, and it's federal funds that pays it? Does that go into general fund or do we just skip it? I know the police department doesn't get it. Um, but maybe some of those general funds need, could be looked at in a more generous, uh, applicable way. And um, I think... Vicki, very much for speaking up about uh, El Oso, and I'd like to offer you an opportunity, Councilman. You ready? Okay. I'm very, uh, I'm delighted with the deal with uh, Grand Canyon and the golf course. As long as the golf course uh, allows City of Phoenix residents to play, all right, um, how would, uh, I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for you to approach Grand Canyon for El Oso Park and form a, uh, they have all kinds of sports programs. Think what wonderful opportunity it'd be for interns. If we can't, uh, if we keep hopscotching uh, over that wonderful sports park in West Phoenix, uh, and I'm not begrudging any park, Anything they can get, okay? <laughs> but we need to have, uh, uh, this is ours and we're thrilled with this. We're thrilled with new lights at Sueño and other kinds of things. But sir, I'd like an appointment with you uh, right away to talk about a Grand Canyon partnership for El Oso Park. You, okay. On video. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, for speaking up. And for, every, for everyone who speaks up on behalf of your neighbor, I, I, that's always my favorite thing to hear. I want to mention something. Um, the, the attrition that we're hearing about, okay? We're losing police officers, losing firefighters every day. The, budgets, the budget is calling for 110 police officers. 
90 firefighters. You have to remember, a few years ago, the plan was to have a hiring freeze, five-year hiring freeze. Imagine that, not, hire, not hiring a cop for five years, which is crazy. It's, it's crazy to think about that. And, uh, and we, we didn't do that. I mean, I, I, you remember, I, I personally went out to D.C. and we won a grant. It was the, a cops grant, the, high, the largest cops grant in the nation that year, $1.83 million, which is a lot of money, but it was only 15 cops. Right, every cop, every cop really matters. I know that. I, so, 15 here, 11 there. It's so. Finally, I'm really excited to see 110 cops in this budget. The attrition we are losing cops. I want to say, and I. Uh, well, Chief Curtinbach is in here. We're probably losing between 40 and 80, probably every any given year, through attrition, through uh, up to 90. You know. Uh, through uh, each year through attrition, which means retirement, you know, we have a, about 2,800 cops that adds up. We are going to experience that with or without a plan to hire more cops. And that is what we have to understand, right? Even uh, including the fire side. We have 90 firefighters in this particular budget. Firefighters are going to retire at the end of their uh, career. So, so oh, I, I, I'm with you. This is a step in the right direction. We're not finished. Absolutely not finished. This is a step in the right direction. We are going to see attrition regardless. Uh, finally, we have something to combat attrition the way it used to be several years ago, and, and we're really moving forward. Uh, uh, Suzanne mentioned the golf course, and I mentioned this for the benefit of everyone who lives in, in, the, in Phoenix, frankly. The Maryville Golf Course is one of several that we have with the city of Phoenix. And you'll remember the talk was, do we close it down? What do we do with it? Closing it down would be the absolute worst thing we can do. Imagine a bowl of blight right here, in the, right in the, uh, the heart of Maryville. I would not have learned to golf had it not been for the Maryville Golf Course. And having it being a city course, a couple bucks, you get to learn to play. I am no Tiger Woods, and I figured that out. Okay, but at least I figured it out. I had that opportunity. It kept me off the streets, and, and it was nice, which is what Vicky I think is talking about with the Loso Park now, and Suzanne as well. The uh, so we were losing, if I'm not mistaken, two hundred seventy thousand dollars a year in that one golf course. Okay, so do we close it down? Well, the answer is no. I approached Grand Canyon University on a public-private partnership. GCU is taking over the operating cost. It remains a city course. City fees, residents can play. It remains a city course. Nothing will change that. We, we never sold the course. That, that's the agreement. It, it's a city course. GCU will take it over. They, will, they are more an operator than, than Phoenix is, okay? Uh, they have a sports management team. They're gonna roll that, a sports management, management uh, uh, when I say team, I'm talking about that's part of the, well, they have, that's one of their degrees. So they'll, they'll have students and interns working, uh, you know, with that particular golf course. They will turn it into a profitable golf course. They are investing $12 million into that golf course, which then will make it the, probably the nicest municipal golf course in the country. It'll help the housing, uh, you know, the, 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 just the, the fact that it's going to help uh, all of the, the, the homeowners uh, around the community. And I'm, I'm a little, you know, I wanted to mention this also. I've also approached GCU. They've agreed to do this. They are going to have one of the largest first tees program in the country as well, meaning they're going to inter introduce golf to these inner city neighborhood kids, and they'll do it for free. You know, so that's one of the things that they uh, plan on doing, uh, and I will absolutely contact them and and you know maybe talk about it also as well. Uh, I'm also working with the Brewers. What's that? I did you say don't make you? I don't want to. I don't want to make you, Suzanne. No, but I mentioned that because uh, so but so that's why it's closed right now. If you pass by it, I have to. I say that as often as I can because people pass by and they're thinking, "What well, did they close the course down? What happened? How did that?" It's being renovated. We're going to cut that ribbon in a few months, and uh, it, it'll 
it's going to be the nicest city course in the country, and it's going to be ours. Ours meaning Phoenix's, regardless of where you live. It's going to be a gem. It's good for all of us, and it's good for all taxpayers because we're not losing $270,000 anymore. We, we thought outside the box and found a partner. Okay, uh, John Walker, followed by Jim Williams. Uh, good evening. Thank you for taking my comments. My name is John Walker. I'm a longtime Phoenix resident. I've lived, uh, mostly lived in Phoenix for the past 25 years. Uh, I'm uh, here also on behalf of Phoenix spokespeople. We have about 1,500 supporters uh, throughout the Phoenix area. Um, I think that Phoenix definitely needs more serious bike infrastructure. Um, Phoenix does need transportation solutions. I think we've been seeing that with the advent of light rail, and, and the proof is in the pudding. With light rail, the numbers are higher than, than expected. People use it, uh, and it's a great uh, option for people to use. Um, and cities haven't uh, solved their transportation uh, issues or problems with single occupancy vehicles, and trying to do so is just a recipe for disaster. It will result in more sprawl, more pollution, um, and it affects everyone in a bad way. Um, and without change, Phoenix could continue in this direction. I really hope that doesn't happen. Um, touching on light rail, uh, you know, if we talk about cars and the infrastructure we need to build for cars, that's incredibly expensive too. I hear people complaining about uh, the, the city subsidizing light rail, but car driving is incredibly subsidized. The highway constructions cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and we're all paying for that. And if, if one individual is taking a car every day to and from work and doing all their trips, that's going to be a lot of wear and tear on the roads, and that takes a lot of money on maintenance. So the more people we can get to use bikes to, do, to go to work, to go to the grocery store, the less wear and tear the streets are facing. Uh, the grid bike share program has been a great success. I think that's showing that there's a pent-up demand for different modes of transportation other than driving a car, and it is, uh, by and large, privately funded. So that's a great win-win situation. Um, the bike infrastructure has to come before the cyclists are going to go on the road. If you ask yourself the question, well, there's no demand, but you're not really even seeing it because you're not making it possible. And especially with biking, where you're not surrounded by a big box of steel, you're going to feel vulnerable if you're not given that adequate infrastructure. Um, Libby mentioned that millennials are driving less. They want to drive less. And, and Phoenix, as a, the hub of this metropolitan area, can sell that as something to offer people in ways that Chandler can, in ways that other more suburban communities cannot. We can sell that urban experience with light rail, with grid, but we have to be serious about making people feel safe on bikes. So when I do talk about bike lanes and bike infrastructure, I don't just mean pain on the ground, because that does not create a sense of security for individuals. Um, I'm talking about protected bike lanes. We don't have a protected bike lane in Phoenix. Tempe just built one recently. Other cities around the country are building them because they make, them, they make people feel safe riding their bike. Um, 8 to 88 to feel safe. You know, anyone as young as uh, 8 or as old as 88 can feel safe riding a bike when it's a protected bike lane because it separates that big car or truck from the person on the bicycle. Um, and I, I would request that people ask themselves the question, would I feel comfortable having my grandchild or my grandparent ride a bike on that street here in Phoenix? And I think too often the answer is no, because we don't, we haven't been providing that proper infrastructure. And we're moving in the right direction. And I do uh, request that the city of Phoenix spend $1.50 per resident per year. That's a very, very modest amount of money, and I certainly hope that we would spend more. Um, I have gotten, I did inquire about the budget, and thank you to uh, Ray Dovalina and Mr. Paniagua. They did respond to me and give me some information about uh, this $24.5 million that's allotted for bike infrastructure over the next five years. And that sounds great, but I do have some serious concerns. That, that is a moving in the right direction. But the projects I do, that, I, that I saw in this $24.5 million allotment, they lack a focus on bike infrastructure for bike commuting. This, the infrastructure we should be investing in is for, so people can use it every day to get to work, to get to the store, all across Phoenix. Um, there is no mention at this point of protected bike lanes, and I think that's a really worthwhile investment. Uh, one of the big ticket items in this $24.5 million allotment is a $6.5 million pedestrian bridge from the Science Center uh, to the uh, uh, Children's Museum. And I think that's wonderful, but I don't think that's appropriate to be allocated or, or categorized as a bicycle infrastructure. That's great pedestrian infrastructure, but um, let's not categorize that as a cycling infrastructure Bikes aren't going to be using that bridge. They're going to be crossing at Fillmore and the, the designated 
places where they should be crossing. Um, what we do need are protected bike lanes on 3rd Ave, north going past City Hall. I used to work at the county attorney's office for seven years uh, before moving to another position, and I would bike commute for many years going north on 3rd Ave, and um, there's three or four lanes heading in one direction with no bike lane there, and that would be a great spot to put in a protected bike lane. Washington and Jefferson, five lanes of vehicular traffic moving in one direction. There is no way that we need that sort of vehicular capacity. That'd be a perfect place to put it and send a message to people that not only does Phoenix welcome cars, it also welcomes pedestrians and cyclists and light rail. Um, and Third Street up to Steel Indian School Park. Those are all great potentials, uh, underutilized streets that can be used with uh, protected bike lanes. So I Thank ask you. the city to, to support that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, speaking up uh, for bic bicyclists and again, multimodal Phoenix. I'm, I'm totally supportive of a, of a multimodal Phoenix for those who rely on it because they have to and for those who one day wish to rely on it because they really want to. And Suzanne, you talked about taking light rail you know, that's probably an experience you you probably never thought you would. Oh, yeah. no, did it on the very first night. Oh, that's very great. <laughs> uh, Jim Williams, followed by Rachel Johnson. And uh, last call for some cards. We, we just have a couple more. Hey, my name is Jim Williams. I live in Maryville. And uh, I'd just like to say I'm... I'm don't know a whole lot about all of this that's going on. I came to listen, but I hear things about the uh, One Phoenix ID and that we're following New York and how much it costs New York to implement the ID system. We got some lady from New York coming out to talk to us about the, getting that going on the One Phoenix ID. <clears throat> and living in Maryville, uh, when, when you're talking about spending money to, to give people identification, I would rather see that money spent on more cops. I appreciate the fact that we're getting some more cops here. You said you got a grant from Washington to, to get some cops hired then you said that it was going to cost 1.4 billion dollars to build a light rail and we had eight billion dollar return on that so I don't know why we had to get a grant with eight billion dollars we ought to be able to hire a lot of cops and living in Glendale or uh, Maryville you can hear gunfire just about every night my window got shot out of my car a few months ago um, I can turn the corner to go to my house I ride a motorcycle I get a contact high turn in the corner because people are smoking dope on the corner house and I'd like to see more cops and a bigger police presence all over the neighborhood before I'd like to see people with this one Phoenix ID. I mean, police is uh, real important to me because riding a motorcycle, I'd like to see a bigger presence. I, I watch people run red lights. I see people cutting people off. People have no regard for the law because the laws aren't being enforced because they're, they're taken up with other things. There's, there's not enough of them to go around. So when you start talking about a, an identification or an IT guy or what have you, I, I just can't see that I'm opposed to it completely and would rather see any money that we have, if, if we're talking millions of dollars for that, I'd rather see that go to the police department. Thank you. Thank you for speaking up. Mr. Williams, thank you for, uh, for coming out, for listening, and more importantly, for actually filling out a card and coming out and, and, uh, and, and speaking up. I, I couldn't agree more with almost everything. W police... I, this is a firefighter speaking, and I think Chief Gleason is, is in, may still be in the room, and he might throw something at me. No, I think Chief Gleason would actually agree. You know, public safety is our number one priority, and you have a firefighter saying, of that, our police officers are our number one priority. We need cops on the street. Certainly, we need more of a police uh, presence in Maryville. We are blessed with some great leadership with our police department from the very top to our commanders, who happens to be right behind you, leading the Maryville Precinct. Uh, and our police chief, by the way, we have our assistant police, police chief who just left the Maryville Precinct. His boss uh, is another former uh, commander from their Maryville Precinct, Joe Yonner. There's some great leadership coming out of uh, Maryville. The, the ID part of it, uh, it's, it's being discussed as if that's what was proposed. And um, the vote that I cast it, and the vote that was cast was should city staff research a card that would consolidate services like our library card, for an example, again, you know, transportation, maybe there's our cards that we use at senior centers. 
it, it wouldn't make sense to consolidate those things. And, um, and that was the discussion. Again, it's, it's archived. Uh, I know that there has been some discussion, uh, people talking on one side or the other. At, as far as that vote was, con you know, the concern of that particular vote, that particular subcommittee, that particular agenda, that was the discussion. And it's, gonna, it's going to continue. Um, uh, there, there is no price tag. I understand that, you know, New York did something and it costed X amount of, you know, millions and San Francisco may have done something, LA may have done something, Phoenix hasn't done anything. We're at a point right now where we need to research to figure out if it makes sense to consolidate these things. You know, some, I tell you what, I, I have a gym membership card, I have a grocery store card, I have another grocery store card. I have, you know, would it make sense to me in my life to have one card that fits, you know? And that's pretty much how I see the, um, the, the city services, um, you know, potential, whatever that is, that card. So that's, so that said, I mean, please, you're obviously paying attention. I really appreciate that as the, co the conversation continues. Um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes at the end of the day. If it costs any money, it's gonna, have, it's gonna require a vote. And, you know, I mean, I do agree with you. Our priorities need to be with public safety at the end of the day. Uh, okay, so Rachel Johnson. Hello, thank you, um, Councilman Valenzuela. I just appreciate you being here tonight. Um, I am, see, a, a fairly new resident to Phoenix in that I've been here about 12 years. I came here by way of Tucson, originally from San Francisco. So there's been quite a bit of talk tonight about San Francisco, and I can clear up any, any questions that you may have about what's happened in San Francisco. But I will tell you, I absolutely would not change being a resident of Phoenix for any amount of money in the world. Our unique beauty in this city, our unique cultures that are intertwined in this community, I believe is what brings value here. So with that said, I also want you to know that I serve as a member of the Phoenix Arts and Culture Commission. I am um, very passionate about arts and culture in this city and that there be continued funding in that regard. Um, I thank you personally for your commitment in um, being supportive of funding in that area. In particular, the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture has just done a tremendous job in making sure that there are arts learning opportunities for young people and those of actually of any age. So whether it's adults, anyone who has a passion and understanding, a love, an interest in the arts altogether has that opportunity um, right here in our city. The grants program has been an absolute um, success in that it has brought artists who otherwise would not have an opportunity to show their art in the city and maybe even get commission funding from it they have that here in Phoenix, but we need your support and that of the other um, members of the city council as well as our mayor to be able to see programs like that continue. There's another program called Arts Build, which you may be familiar with it right here in District 5, and an Arts Build is a program that is based in science, technology, math, and art, and, that, and engineering, and that particular program allows um, all these different interdisciplines to come together and to be able to show that there's art in everywhere that we see. I mean, in the city of Phoenix, I see art when I walk through the airport and I, I look at the new tram terminal, or even in the regular terminals, Terminal 3, there's art. If people stop long enough and they look at the floor, they'll realize that someone was commissioned to do that. In Terminal 4, there's, there's actually art all along the walls, but most of the time we're running to catch our flights and we don't pause long enough to see that. So my point is the city has done a tremendous job to build this foundation to make sure that arts and culture are part of the daily life of every Phoenician and even those who visit who receive that benefit. But I would love to see that to continue to go. And I know on behalf of the commission, all of us would like to see that continue and be part of the legacy that we leave behind here in Phoenix for those who will inherit the city from us. Um, in addition to that, I want to see continued funding for um, 
I call it like the beautification, if you will, the beautification of the canals, the beautiful beautification of the bike paths, um, also as well as the freeways where you can see a Coco Pelli or you can see the artwork as you're driving through. And those may be things that we take for granted, but we, the reality of it is, is funding is needed for all of that. So whether it's public art, like the ones I just mentioned, or whether it's arts and learning or the grants program, we need your support in order to continue to make that happen. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. You've, you have my support. I think you, you, you have my support, certainly with the arts. It's important um, for our youth. I actually sit on, um, one of the boards I sit on is the Phoenix Center for the Arts. And we're, we're, I'm working on a public-private partnership to bring arts into Maryville. A lot of our schools have lost arts. You know, uh, and so working on something, stay tuned. No tax dollars is another sort of like the Maryville golf course thing, a public-private partnership to bring arts into the Maryville Community Center, and hopefully we'll have something to announce soon. Um, uh, okay. Oh, and I also want to mention, for those of you who live in this particular area, the 107th Canal Project, right? That's been... That's been a public safety issue as far as I'm concerned for a very, very long, for decades, literally. And Ray Dovalina is here who's worked so hard and several others, he, he was here. He's right, he's right behind you, Ms. Johnson. He's worked so hard. He would never believe that I'm complimenting him. I'm glad he's here. No, he, Ray's, Ray's a great guy and he's, he's worked so hard with the residents uh, of this particular neighborhood and around on the 107th Avenue Canal Project, which has been... It's, that's been blight, and it's just been a public safety issue. Several uh, schools in the area, you have this beautiful park here, and kids are walking to and from school, and it's been a major concern. And finally, it's covered, you know, which has been a huge win. And, and now the arts, now it's time to, for, for the walking path, the beautification of it, and so that's, that's being done out here. Uh, and to go from zero to 60, because that's pretty much what we had to do, working closely with the constituency here. And the best part is, uh, this is working the way it's supposed to work in a democracy. Uh, the, the constituency in the area, it, you know, they, they're putting their thoughts to it. Their fingerprints will be on this uh, the way it, it should be. And it's, it, you know, it's heavily weighted on the people who live in the area, but I mean, every, just like everyone is here who may not live here, it belongs to the city of Phoenix. So if, you, uh, if, you're, in, you know, if you're all about walking paths and bike trails and, or the arts, please come out. Stay tuned for those meetings because we have a lot of decisions to, to, to make uh, and, and Ray's working really hard to make that possible. So thank you, Ray. Okay, uh, Rob Abornson? As Bjornson. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Councilman Valenzuela, and thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to come tonight. Um, this is my first budget hearing, and uh, I'm honored to be here and just share a little bit, a bit about why I'm here. Um, I've been a resident of Arizona for uh, 17 years, since 98. Came out here from Colorado, uh, went to school there. Uh, got involved right away with the mortgage industry. and. Uh, Succeeded with it um, until it crashed, came into a, hit a brick wall, and um, I found myself in a predicament with two children that I have uh, here in Arizona that uh, I couldn't pay my child support, and so I was incarcerated. I <clears throat> went to Tent City, and while I was in Tent City, angered by what just happened to me, I rapidly, as an innovator and as an entrepreneur, I rapidly searched and sought out the solutions uh, to why I was here and to figure out what can we do as a community to provide single dads and to provide single parents opportunities to have a portion of their child support paid when there's no programs available uh, in our marketplace, in our community, to prevent these um, haphazards uh, where children become distraught wondering why their dad's not picking them up. And so when I came out, um, 
I had put together uh, a system called Father Figure Foundation, where as of uh, March last month, we're Arizona's newest nonprofit. We just received our tax determination letter. And so we're as legit as any other nonprofit, but as a grassroots nonprofit, we're needing the exposure, we're needing project partners, we're needing donations, contributions, uh, corporate sponsors, and grants. Uh, we have a budget. Uh, I have a, a former DOD agent, that's my CPA. Uh, she's gonna be doing all of our book work. Uh, her background comes from uh, the IRS, and she's uh, extremely good at what she does. Um, our program has, in conclusion, our program has two platforms. Our first is to provide single dads opportunities uh, through a high-level security and background check uh, once approved into our organization. Uh, we have no membership fees. We're 100% philanthropic. So our dads will be able to, our single dads will be able to come into our organization once uh, classified in a risk level from high risk to low risk. We'll be able to provide these single dads opportunities to uh, get involved with the community and community service projects and volunteerism. Those hours worked once we direct them to a project with membership ID numbers. Uh, these dads will be able to convert these credit hours to cash that Father Figure Foundation will write the checks for to pay a portion, not all of it, but a portion of their unpaid child support. Um, and so with that, <clears throat> leads into our second, which is wrapped around our kids. Uh, we don't want our kids to go without ever. Uh, and so when I hear about arts and culture and beautifying our communities and making sure that our kids win no matter what, whether the dad steps out of the picture uh, or is challenged financially losing a job, we don't want the kids to go without. Uh, so when I did my research, um, the stats here in America are staggering. Uh, $116 billion is passed due in child support arrearages, which, is ex which poses a $53 billion tax burden to us. So with four, four out of five kids in America that don't participate in extracurriculars and sports and music and arts and culture and drama and culinary, they could tend to go down a path that causes uh, nuisance in our society and our community. Drugs, alcohol, depression, suicide, the list goes on. So our second step is to make sure that our kids win in extracurricular activities and project partners when the, built on a reward system when the parents are directed to uh, get involved with our, um, our third party mentorship or coaching type platforms. So the, the more the parents do, the more they earn a value for the kids where Father Figure Foundation will write a check and get kids involved in music and sports. So. Okay. I have, to, I have to stop you there, Mr. Espionson, but quickly, if you want to give us the website or tell us how to get a hold of you. Yeah, uh, the website's really easy. FatherFigureFoundation.org okay. uh, is our website, and we would be honored to be considered into any type of a budget to help uh, build out our beta test. Okay. So, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The last card, final card, is uh, Walt Gray. Thank you, uh, Councilman Valenzuela. Uh, I, this is the third city hearing that I've been at, and I, the same message each time is, uh, I think I've reviewed the city manager's budget. I think there's an opportunity, there may be other opportunities to raise revenue, but I think there's an opportunity by increasing innovation. Uh, the city has averaged $24 million a year the past four years in innovation. If they do, uh, they, they're almost at their goal of 100 million, but there's no need to stop at 100 million. So I believe if the city just did one third of what it normally does, it'll raise a, a net of $6 million in revenue, uh, which uh, can be used for, 6 million can go quite a way. And maybe we could even supplement that with Super Bowl revenues, uh, tax revenues. So I think, the city manager lists in his budget a number of areas in which there are needs, uh, and I think that all those areas are very good. I'm particularly interested in the PAC programs. Uh, we once had 80, we now have 44. Um, we once had spent $800,000 a year on summer youth programs. We now spend $250,000 a year. Uh, the homeless are, uh, their shelter is, has problems and they need some help. And there are 
other other needs. Also, I believe, uh, while this is not in the city manager's budget, but I believe there should be an addition to the economic development department that would uh, concentrate on blue collar jobs for Phoenix. Um, I think the economic development department, uh, you know, uh, particularly with the new initiative that the new director has, uh, I think there's going to be swamp with, uh, with things to do and they're not going to be able to concentrate on the, and there's just a shortage of blue collar jobs. And then another thing that I think is important is that uh, the city used some of that money, the $6 million or more, um, to contract with the Maricopa Corporate College to train those who do menial jobs in city government, clean the bathrooms, clean the offices. Those people uh, ha should have the opportunity to have equal opportunity, and they may need some training to, to come out of the the bottom and go into other jobs in city government where they can do be more productive and get higher uh, pay for their work. Uh, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Gray. Ms. Gray was mentioning the efficiency, the innovation. There's a, we have a subcommittee. One of them, I also sit on this one, the finance efficiency, innovation, sustainability. And so far, what has been saved through innovation is $98 million. We're almost there. Uh, of course, we're not going to stop there. There's two ways to, to climb ourselves out of a recession. Uh, and, you know, and, and there's no one way. I'm, I'm sorry. I see, I see two different ways. There's cutting and there's growing. And I think you have to do both. Sometimes we do have to cut. We're running on our leanest government in 40 years. Uh, but I really believe we need to grow our way out of this recession, which means we've been talking about it, things like transportation, something that I mentioned in other subcommittee meetings. I, uh, so I chaired downtown aviation redevelopment subcommittee and uh, I'm, I'm leading this initiative on entrepreneurship. And uh, the goal is to create 5,000 enterprises in the next five years or welcome 5,000 enterprises in the next five years. And I think we're gonna do it right here in the city of Phoenix. Uh, by becoming this community where people want to be part of. In fact, it's already happening. We just landed the VA Angels, which is one of the the more successful, angel, in, the largest angel investment group out of Canada that could have gone anywhere in the United States to expand, and they chose Phoenix. So they're working with our young entrepreneurs, uh, working with the corporate college, uh, you know, creating, a, a, hopefully we'll have an announcement soon on that as well. The makerspace, it describes what you were talking about and helping some of the blue collar workers and those just the manufacturing industry while we're according of course doing all we can to attract tech jobs because I mean those are really important jobs uh, let's not forget the manufacturing jobs as well so we just have so much to, to, to share thank you I'm hoping everyone uh, signed in I'm uh, please take one of those uh, budget hearing uh, pamphlets with you. Thank you so much. There, uh, on the back of those pamphlets, you have every all of you know. You have the mayor's information as well as the uh, eight council members. Our phone numbers. I believe email addresses might be on there. Please feel free to call, be heard, send an email, uh, do those things uh, because it is budget time. You know, and at the end of all of this, whether people speak up or not. We have to vote on a budget. By law, we are going to adopt the budget. So we have to speak up on that. So thank you for speaking up uh, on behalf of yourselves and, and your neighbors. And uh, thank you for coming out and God bless you. You've been watching a community budget hearing held recently in Phoenix. For questions, comments, or ideas, please visit phoenix.gov or call 602-262-4800. You can also send feedback or videos through social media at hashtag Phoenix Budget. This video can also be seen online at phoenix.gov forward slash 11 or youtube.com forward slash city of Phoenix AZ.